Hello, and welcome to this special Lowy Institute panel on Papua New Guinea's Indigenous languages as part of what we are calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute. I'm Jessica Collins, a research fellow in the Institute's AusPNG Network and Pacific Islands program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, as well as the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and pay my respects to elders past and present. 2019 was the United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages. In recognition that a year was not long enough to protect, bolster and promote Indigenous languages, the United Nations dedicated an entire decade to it. On January 1 of this year, the United Nations International Decade of Ind Indigenous Languages began. There is no country in the world that holds more Indigenous languages than Papua New Guinea. Current estimates of its living languages are between 830 to over 850. That number though has been in steady decline since Papua New Guinea's colonization. But while extinction to local languages remains a severe problem, a new Papua New Guinean language was recently added to the list. Today, we are going to talk about and unpack how a language came to be added to Papua New Guinea's list of document, documented languages. But first, we'll discuss the significance of Indigenous languages for Papua New Guinea's cultural diversity and identity. And I'm pleased to introduce the panel joining me today to discuss these issues. First up, we have Dr. Kalala Devetichi, Senior Research Fellow and Program Leader from the Papua New Guinea National Research Institute. Kalala's academic advocacy has focused on the benefits of bilingual education in Papua New Guinea schools. We also have Dr. Lydia Mazzatelli, a postdoctoral doctoral researcher at the Slavic Institute in the University of Cologne. Lydia was a principal investigator on the project that documented and described the, the Kurumao language, the latest Papua New Guinean language to be added to its extensive list. Adjunct Professor Craig Volker is also joining us from the Cairns Institute at James Cook University. Craig is a specialist in Papua New Guinea language documentation, Tok Pisin and Pigeon Creole studies, and second language teaching of Tok Pisin, English and German. Craig also writes extensively in the media about Papua New Guinea's indigenous languages. And finally, we have Dr. Sakarepe Kamene, Head of Lingu Linguistics and Modern Languages at the University of Papua New Guinea who has also publicly advocated for the preservation of Papua New Guinea's languages and the challenges of language preservation for this country. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get straight into it. Sakarepe, I'd like to start with you first. <clears throat> Can you tell us about the nature of indigenous languages in Papua New Guinea? Just how many languages do you think there are across this extensive landscape? Well, that's a question I think we need to do more work on it to find out. Actually, if you get a new one coming out, that suggests that there are many probably are not discovered yet, I think. Mm -hmm. So the numbers could vary greatly. But at the moment, we have uh, very old numbers that exist, about 800 something, 30, 850. Many of them are very small in terms of number of speakers, half of them, I think, 450 or 500, uh, very small. I was looking at a late net Otto Nekito's research book. He says about uh, 427 or something has less than 500 speakers. That's, that's a matter for concern for many of us in Papua New Guinea. Because there are many small languages, they are practically not possible to include all of them in education and other things. And probably that's why many people are looking at larger languages to use in a practical sense for education and other purposes. And many other small ones are somewhat neglected. And with the fast increasing uh, big large projects in, especially in rural areas, that's a matter for concern because we haven't done enough research in many of these rural areas where small languages exist. And with the coming of this large development, 
they could really affect and quickly diminish our vernacular languages or top places in our uh, rural areas. So, so that's one major concern. Big developments amidst all these uh, uh, local cultures and languages, it may really severely affect many other languages, which we really do not have much idea about them. So smaller languages, we haven't really worked to find out what their statuses are, whether they are decreasing their maribond status, status or whether they're increasing in terms of number of speakers. So it's quite a complex situation with the dynamics of economics coming into play. And in Papua New Guinea, I think uh, social type of aspects have been neglected. There's more economic uh, aspects have been promoted much vigorously. So that could also have a negative impact on many of our smaller languages. So, so my concern is the smaller languages we know very little about at this moment. Large number of it is Mandang Sipic area. So again, that area is also being affected by big developments. So, so again, this is the concern. It's complex. We know little about all these languages. So the impact, negative impact could be quite severe on many of these languages. Well, I'll leave it there. Anyone who wants to comment on it? Thanks, Sakarepe. Yeah, I think I might bring Craig in at this point, actually, and just um, see if he can uh, unpack for us uh, what it takes to uh, become an independent language. What are the characteristics and, and how does that uh, play out in place like Papua New Guinea, where there are just so many languages sitting side by side? Okay, well, linguists like to talk about the difference between uh, language and dialect. So we've got different varieties of speech. Um, you know, I speak more American, you speak more Australian, but we can understand each other easily. So we speak different dialects of the same language. But if I speak my ancestral language, German, perhaps you and I won't be able to understand each other. So we say that English and German are different languages. And so we've got the same thing happening in Papua New Guinea, except that these, this idea of language and dialect is really introduced from Europe into Papua New Guinea. Um, in, in Papua New Guinea, people don't make that distinction um, as uh, distinctly or, or as readily as people would in Europe. Um, so it's important not only uh, in terms of identity of, of people whose identity is very connected to the um, ground where they live and to the, the village where they live and to the clans with which they're associated. It's important that not only that we talk about the different languages and we describe those different languages, but that we also describe different dialects um, uh, in within a, a language group. Thanks, Craig. They sound like really important distinctions to be making in a place like Papua New Guinea and um, in a place that's so linguistically diverse uh, as this country. So Kalala, can you tell us what's happening with Tok Pisin and English? Is it, are these becoming the dominant languages and is this a problem? Yes, thank you, Chess. It's very interesting how these two languages are, are taking dominance in the country at the moment. Okay, so um, it, is a, it is in fact um, a concern for some of us uh, when we try to think about local languages or indigenous languages that are not being spoken uh, quite well now by the current generation. Okay, the current generation tend to speak more of uh, Tokpisin and English, which have now, Tokpisin is actually now the dominant, the language of dominance in Papua New Guinea. Okay, even, um, even in the homes, languages or indigenous languages are not uh, spoken uh, most often. And the problem is when we have uh, mixed marriages, that is the problem right there. Mixed marriages, I mean, um, uh, a couple 
uh, coming from two different language backgrounds. So when we have a lot of that have, uh, in existence now in Papua New Guinea to uh, a couple coming either from the island, one from the highlands. So when they are in the home, they tend to speak more of Tokisin than uh, English. And they do not speak the mother tongue at home. And that is how children do not grasp the language of either the father or the mother in the home. And that is very problematic right now. And I'm sure the others who are listening on here will agree with me that that is what's happening now because there's a lot of mixed marriages in Papua New Guinea and the languages are not, the indigenous languages are not being spoken. And especially when we come to, um, uh, to uh, families who live in the cities or towns of Papua New Guinea, they'd rather, they'd, they'd rather to speak English or talk this into their children in the homes and not their languages. So that is something that I've been very vocal about. I've spoken, uh, you know, like in the, in, in the media outlets on TV and other uh, uh, platforms like that, trying to encourage parents that the onus is now on the parents to take on board that responsibility to speak the mother tongue, the vernacular in the home. Because um, if um, some of you know uh, the um, vernacular language or the vernacular education, which um, uh, was uh, used in the outcomes-based education has now been thrown out the window and we are back to, to using English only in the classrooms. So what happened during the time of the OB when vernacular education was in existence was um, the first three years of education was in the mother tongue. They called it topless, topless schools. So we had elementary one, elementary two, uh, elementary one, sorry, prep, uh, e, e prep, elementary one, and then elementary two. And then when they completed that phase, they would move on to the, uh, uh, to the primary school, or lower primary school, which started off in with grade three. So during that time, uh, that is something which I, I did uh, quite a lot of work on, on the transitioning from the, the, the mother tongue into English. So the problem I found was that teachers who are supposed to be teachers in grade three, they, these teachers are supposed to be teachers who spoke or speak the languages of the children, the students that they are teaching. But in most instances, um, uh, there were teachers who were speakers of Tokpisin from another, another language group. They did not uh, speak the languages of the children. So when the, the transitioning from the children's mother tongue to English uh, was happening, the teachers were using Tokpisin to transition the children from their language to English. So there was a lot, there's a big problem right there. Teachers who are who supposed to be in grade three to transition the children from their mother tongue to English, supposed to be a, a speaker of the child's language, but it didn't happen that way. So that was how there was a lot of uh, problem in there. So um, I, I can see Craig nodding his head. I think he, these are the kind of problems that we, we have uncovered in Papua New Guinea schools. And so because of that uh, situation, um, uh, politicians or people up the hierarchy decided to, to uh, abolish that, uh, that um, system of using vernacular education. And now we are back to SBC, which is using English only as the language of instruction in the classrooms. But according to my own research, as um, somebody who is uh, very much interested in, in uh, like I put all my, my work into bilingual education using the first, the mother tongue as the first language for a child in his or her education um, journey, using the mother tongue is the way to go. But what I found in my research was that it was not implemented, although it is a very brilliant theory, bilingual education or uh, teaching a, a child in his or her first language, that did not happen simply because of the Im implementation part of it. The imp implementation was not correct. And one of the reasons was just what I gave. And there are other issues that, other factors that were also involved in this. So it's said to say that um, the vernacular education using mother tongue in the 
PNG education system has now been thrown out the window. It's been abolished and it's now back to English only. So that is, it is quite a big problem at the moment when it comes to language education. And so my, my take on this is that um, when I've been uh, interviewed and been asked by reporters, I've always taken back my view that uh, even if we do not use bilingual education anymore, maybe uh, use, um, uh, still teach the language just like teaching Bahasa Indonesia or Tokpis, uh, what's this, uh, Japanese, or Mandarin, uh, teach the language as a subject in the classroom. Uh, uh, I mean, these are just my ideas or my views because it is, it is really problematic. And if we have to preserve and maintain the PNG languages, how do we do that? So the other only option, apart from uh, uh, reintroducing it in the classrooms is back to the parents. I have always been uh, telling parents or advocating for parents that parents need to speak to their children in their mother tongue or what we call in PNG talkless. The vernacular that needs to be spoken in the home. So at least the children can appreciate their own language because language goes together with the identity that all this needs to be appreciated. But that is not happening at the moment. So that is why I've been uh, drumming it into parents, even like people I, I have discussions with we need to speak the language, our mother tongue to our children. And it especially the problem is with educated parents. Educated parents don't have time to speak their, their language to their, their, their children. It is always talk to see no English. Maybe I will stop there. You can come back to me later and let me give a opportunity to others to talk. There's a lot to talk about. Thank you, Jess. Could, could I just break in there? Um, I think what, what uh... Kilala has said is very important about parents. And I think one of the problems is that parents don't know how uh, in, in mixed marriages, how to use both languages within a family. And for that reason, they use Tokpisan or with educated families, they use English. And uh, I think the media in Papua New Guinea fail us because they don't give enough opportunity to people like Kilala to explain to parents through radio or TV or newspapers um, how families can use different languages within um, a family. You know, I know uh, my children were raised with, with three languages quite easily um, uh, because both the mother and I were, were comfortable with the, uh, them using different languages within the family. Sometimes Papua New Guinean families are, are not comfortable um, using a language that one of the parents doesn't speak well. Um, and so people like Kalala can explain to families how to do that would be really useful. Yeah, sure. It sounds like a really important thing to do, especially within the household, uh, starting small. It's something that I wanted to touch on later in this panel is, uh, you know, what are the solutions to these challenges that we're bringing up today? Um, but first, I would like to bring you in, Lydia. Um, I'd like to hear from you at this point, given your experience in a small rural community in New Island, which we'll also touch on in just a minute. Um, but first, I'd just like to ask you, do you think communities are growing more aware of the importance of bracing their Indigenous language? Um, I can speak for communities. I can speak for the Lakurumau community. And even that, as an outsider who went there, in order to study their language and to sensi sensitize in a way. So my, I think my point of view is a bit biased, uh, but what can I say is that the whole community really responded very enthusiastically to me being there and documenting their language. They felt really proud because the neighboring communities already had. Uh, Craig documented Nalik, which is the language uh, just on the south of Lakurumau, the language Kara, which is North, has also been documented, has a Bible translation. So the people in Lakurumau felt a little bit left out and they were really happy to have the language documented. Um, there, are, there are some language activists. Uh, sadly, some of them have passed away, uh, but uh, there are people definitely in the community who feel that the language is present. And literally everyone, when asked directly, would say, yes, it's a shame that some of our children speak better Tokpisin than Nakurumau. Everyone is 
um, I would say is aware of the importance of passing on the language, yes. Whether this then um, becomes practice, really goes into the practice of then transmitting this language that you feel it's so important, there the answer is yes and no. In some families, yes. And in some families, especially mixed families, also a couple of monolingual families, um, it is it is not, but not, not because the people think that it's not important, that I have never met this point of view. Yeah, we don't care. Uh, it's because they don't know how to do, because uh, many children speak Tokpisa and it's cool, then they use Tokpisa in slash English. And you can often see people of, let's say, 30, 40 years of age speaking with each other in the local language. And then when they address the children, then they switch to, to Tokpisa. So the answer that I can give from my outsider perspective is that, yes, definitely people uh, are sensitive to the topic. Um, they have also become more sensitive in the last years that uh, outsiders, unfortunately, mostly have come to the region to document the language, and that also makes them proud. Uh, but there is a problem in the transmission. Uh, absolutely not in devaluing the language, but what Kilala and Craig said, that many people, I think, lack the instruments, lack the basic education just for learning how to speak to your kids and in general to keep the language alive in the community, though they try. I cannot say that they don't. No. Thanks, Lydia. Um, I wanted to um, redirect this question to you as well. Uh, Sir Julius Chan, who is the governor of New Island province where you documented uh, this language. Uh, he's also the former prime minister. He made a statement in 2020 urging new, all New Islanders uh, to hold on to their local languages. He said, it is your identity and makes each and every one of you unique. Through our languages, we honor our ancestors and through our languages, we find ourselves. So are you able to explain to us the dynamic between identity and language um, in Papua New Guinea and how languages work? Are they a marking of belonging to a particular social, cultural or ethnic group? Yes, uh, again, I unfortunately, I cannot speak for the whole of Papua New Guinea and that I think the other three panelists will have more experience. I can speak for what I saw in La Curumao. And there, um, let's say, La Curumao is a highly multilingual society. People there, everyone speaks Tokpisin. Some speak also good English, especially those who went to school during colonial Australian rule because they learned very well English at school. Uh, but, but even now, I mean, some of them really speak good English. Then they speak La Curumao and they also speak the Kara and Nalik, which are the neighboring languages. So the society is multilingual. And the answer to how language relates to identity, I think it's not black or white. It's not just that your language is your identity. On the one side, yes. And I will come to that in just a second. But also your multilingual multilingualism is your identity. I mean, you are not only defined by the fact that you speak that particular Tokples, the particular language, but also by the fact that you can communicate with other groups. In, in other languages, especially in New Island where the communities are small and there are other regions of Papua New Guinea like Enga province, which is basically monolingual. So there perhaps there is less of that. In New Island, almost everyone is multilingual. But then coming back to La Curumau, um, La Curumau has been used by the La Curumau people as a sort of secret code and it is still by children who go in boarding schools in the Kara speaking territory because then they can use La Curumau among themselves to communicate and to keep secrets from the other children. It is not that the language are totally unin unintelligible. You can understand the Kara speaker with La Curumau if you put attention to it, but the La Curumau people also speak Kara. The Kara people do not speak La Curumau because La Curumau is a very small language. It's spoken only one village. So they can use it as a secret code. And they do acknowledge the common origin of Kara, Nalik, uh, La Kurumao, Tigak, and uh, La Bongai people. This is spoken in the north of New Island. They all come from the same ancestral place. They have the same clans, the same tradition. So they acknowledge the common history. 
but they are really very proud that they have their own language. And when I went there and asked the community whether I could go live with them and document, as I said before, they were really enthusiastic because they felt like mm, we wanted to be recognized. So I would say that the identity of Lakuruma people, yes, it is shaped by the fact that they do speak this. They are Lakuruma speakers. Uh, they also say that they come from Lakuruma, even if they don't speak that well the language, but still they would say that they speak it. This, this is a, a huge chapter that I don't know if we do have the time to dwell in, but anyway, they do have a passive knowledge and feel that defines them as Lakuruma people. Um, but I would also say that multilingualism is also a part of identity of being in this large new island region. Uh, I don't know much about the other regions of Papua New Guinea, so perhaps someone else can speak better than me. Uh, but that's, I would say, represents really well what's the situation in Lakurumau. Thanks, Lydia. I'm going to bring in Kalala and Sakarepe in just a minute, but um, we've heard Tokles uh, come up uh, quite a few times already in this discussion. So I'd like to bring in Craig here. Craig's written about Tokles. If you could just talk us through that concept, please. Okay. Uh, Tokles uh, is a Tokpisan word, and it comes from English. Tok means language, and place means your home. So it's the, the language of your home. Um, and as in Australia with indigenous people, um, Papua New Guineans are very closely tied to the land where the ancestors have been living for a very long time. Uh, so your talk place uh, is a reflection of your relationship with your land and with your home and with the people who live in your land. Um, and as Lydia said for Lakurumau people, I think everywhere in Papua New Guinea, when you're walking down the street and you hear somebody uh, in town speaking your language, you turn around, you look, you feel a little happy that uh, you've got somebody who's connected with you. In, in Papua New Guinea, uh, people use the word one talk, which means people who speak the same language. And this is uh, a word like mate in Australia, it's uh, your friend, uh, somebody whom you can trust, somebody whose behavior is predictable, uh, is somebody who speaks the same language that you speak. Thanks, Craig. I'd like to um, bring in Kalala now and hear about your experience with Togpless and, and uh, perhaps your reflections on uh, Sir Governor Chan's uh, phrase about uh, statement about um, uh, uh, language linking to ancestors. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jess. Yes, um, with regards to that, um, I would say that um, uh, I'm a Kuanua speaker to start off with. Kuanua is the, 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 the language of the Tolai people. I'm a Tolai and I'm from, from East New Britain, uh, New Britain Island, but I'm East New Britain. So I speak Kuanua. Kuanua is the, the Tolai language, uh, the language of the Tolais. So uh, when it comes to uh, trying to uh, relate the language I speak back to our, to our ancestors, um, it, is, uh, it, it is actually a challenging question that you know, like you, you asked me to say something, to say, give my view on this. Because as a as a speaker of the of I mean, a Kuan was speaker, uh, we speak the language, but who in their right frame of mind would think that we are, you know, like uh, we think about our ancestors? They that you know, like this, you 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 do this uh, unconsciously, and you don't you don't realize that you are you are speaking a language which has been passed on from generation to generation, uh, you know, like going back to our our, our ancestors. So I think what I'm trying to say here is, um, it is interesting how our languages have been passed on from generation to generation. It has never been, um, I mean, this is, um, uh, okay, the, the, the Tolai language, the Kuno language has, has been uh, documented. I mean, it, it's, it's written. We have Bibles, a Bible that is written in Kuanua. We have our hymn book in Kuanua. So even uh, I must say that the languages uh, the neighboring languages, or like uh, like Nakana in West New Britain, even some in New Island in the Matana, when their languages were not documented yet, 
or like you, the Bible or the hymn books were not written in their languages yet. Uh, they used Kuanua in, 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 in church because Kuanua, my language was already written before way back. I'm not too sure when exactly it was written. But because of that, neighboring um, languages who had not had their languages written used the Kuanua language for, for church services, for, for, for their hymns and for, for the Bible, reading you know, Bible, uh, the word of God in, in, in the Bible was done in Kuanua. So um, uh, my take on that is that um, uh, for, for my language, and unlike other smaller language in, uh, in Papua New Guinea, I'm lucky to say that my, my language was documented long time ago, but it's not that I'm not proud, proud that uh, it was documented. I am sad actually, because the, 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 the current generation have deviated from the original uh, Kuanua language. Uh, a lot of code switching has actually hampered the actual Kuanua language. So code switching, talk Christian and English in the, in the Kuanua language, into the Kuanua language is actually kind of, uh, uh, what, how can I say that? Uh, the language is now not purely Kuanua these days. I just returned from my home in Kokopo in the village uh, like two, two, three weeks ago. And I was actually surprised to hear the way the younger generation speak the language. They do not speak Kuanua all the time now. And when they speak Kuanua, there must be Tokpisin in there. So it's always code switching that is taking place in my village at the moment or in all the, most of the villages in, in East New Britain, I'm speaking for Kokopo, in the villages along the Kokopo area, uh, uh, the Kuanua language or talk less is not really spoken like how it used to be. And two, uh, when uh, it's interesting, uh, as linguists, we know that um, when um, different age groups speak to each other, they speak a certain type of Kuanua or a certain type of talk pisin. And if you try to converse with an older, uh, older or an elderly person, it's different. They speak a different talk pisin to the older person or a different type of kuanua to that elderly person. And that is because the language has changed so much because it is now uh, in the language, there is English and uh, talk pisin in it. So I think what I'm trying to say is this, the, the, the language is now being mixed. So it's not the pure version of kuanua that at all I would speak. It is now, it has been tempered with, so the language has now changed from uh, a pure Kuanua to a Kuanua, which I'm not, you know, we need to give a description to the current type of Kuanua that is being spoken today. So the language is changing. And as we know, language are never static. Language change all the time, and that is what's happening to my language, and I believe that is what's happening to a lot of Papua New Guinean languages today. Thanks, Kalala. It's really interesting local experience and thanks for sharing your insights on that. I'm sure it's not localised as well. I'm sure it's a common experience across mm. Papua New Guinea. Sakarepe, you've made quite a few public statements about how languages are vital because they are vessels of information. I'd really love to hear more about this. Um, paraphrase your words. You said if a language becomes extinct, all sorts of information will be buried with that language. So can you just talk about this perspective for us, please? Yes, I think working with language, I think we realize that, or I realize that language captures all kinds of things and keeps those things, uh, information, land information, river information, fish, or whatever it is in local areas. Also language also captures location where you are. It gives you space and time in your location. So it becomes a way to identify yourself when you have language around with you. But if you lose language, all these things disappear. Those all these things go. So you are left with nothing. And I find this with young people who have uh, gone to school in English, have lost their vernacular languages or talk place. Uh, 
I quite often go to the village while listening to them, they have no space for themselves. They can't locate themselves where they are. And that's becoming a problem in terms of identify themselves in a modern population to have a real strong footing to say whether or not they are educated person, modern Papua New Guinea, or whether they are traditional uh, young people, it's becoming hard in terms of dis making distinctions uh, using identity, the top place, using top place to make distinctions. So uh, that's one of my concerns. One of my experience, my personal experience, in 1978, uh, 1970, 1989, I was uh, doing a research on traditional uh, transaction of properties. And uh, there was a dance that was going to be transacted to another tribe. So I was recording all those things and they said, they told me to re-enter our society, the Zia society, which is my society, you got to know Zia to re-enter. That is the point of entry. That's your identity that you must use. That's a label you must use to enter. So they, they told me, take off all your clothes you know, and get into traditional clothes. And then they said, we are giving you a topic on transaction of this particular dance. And you're going to say the story all in the Zia language, not in talk piecing no mixing, not in English. And that was a challenge, I thought, you know. I was thinking all the time that I'm a Zia person, so I know everything about it, but they challenge. This is where they think your position becomes important, their position becomes important. And that's where they locate their identity. And if you are not, if you are not there, you are losing it and people are concerned. Once they are concerned about loss of identity, loss of your top place, loss of your history. It becomes a serious problem for us in Papua New Guinea. As Lydia was saying, we come from a lingual society also, so you know extensively about other societies if you know their language. Neighboring societies, neighboring communities, if you know their language, you know quite a bit about uh, these neighboring people. They are river systems, their land systems, their marriage systems. So again, that, that knowledge captured as a multilingual person becomes a, a larger kind of say global in inverted commas, global ideas, global knowledge for you to operate in a much wider sense if you are multilingual in that local community. So top plus gives you somewhat restricted kind of way of operating but if you become multilingual, it opens up a bit global way of looking at things, even in that particular area where your neighbors are. So, so we haven't really worked on these many aspects of multilingualism, bilingualism, to really open up what these ideas capture and maintain for us to learn more about the situations we have, especially in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sakharovic. I absolutely love that story. It really is a brilliant vignette to the uh, complex dynamic between identity and language. We're going to move on now to hearing the stories about documentation. So I'd love to hear from Lydia first about her experience in documenting the language of La Kuruma and uh, just exactly what that entailed. Yes, um, the story actually began in Europe when I first met Craig, he came to teach a talk piecing course at the University of Bremen in Germany, where I was working at the time. And I always had the desire to work, to do field work, to work with a yet undocumented language, because so far I had always worked with already documented languages in Europe. And uh, then Craig offered me to organize uh, a stay in the Nalik speaking village where he had um, near to the village where he had been working. I went there and by the way, to catch on what Sakarepa just said, I, um, I, there I studied um, the vocabulary related to landscape. So how the Nalik language 
conceptualizes the landscape. They have different words for different parts of the reef that are not found in English, for instance. So they have their own view of the landscape, something that if the language disappears, also disappears this, this link to, 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 to the land, so to say. Well, uh, when I was there, I, I came to Papua New Guinea for two weeks. And during this time, I made a couple of trips to the village of La Curumau, where Craig had told me that uh, a language was spoken, which had traditionally been considered a dialect of Nalik or of Kara. And I just wanted to ascertain how deviant it was from these two languages. So I basically went there. I asked people to cooperate with me just on one day trip, tell me some basic sentences and some basic words. I compare them to Nalik and Kara. Yes, they are similar, but they are different enough to be a different language. We could say it's like Dutch, Frisian, and German, for instance, or English, Frisian, and, and Dutch. They are all related, but still different languages. Uh, so then I made an application to get a grant. I got it, and I came back to Papua New Guinea for several periods of extended time. I was once three months, four months, and then two months. Uh, during this time, my work consisted of making recordings of people talking in the language. First, I started with simple narratives like my life. What did I plant yesterday in the garden? Uh, I tell you about my family. And then with Mrs. Daina Guruman and other who um, unfortunately passed away last year, uh, and other uh, people from Lakurumau who speak very well Lakurumau and as well as English, we sat down and transcribed word for word. So I had a recording on my computer. I put it in a documentation software called Elan. Uh, I segmented into chants, like I am going, which at, at first, of course, I didn't understand. I learned the language while documenting it. And then I would ask to my consultant, the person who was working with me in that moment, like usually it was uh, Mrs. Gurumang, can you please transcribe exactly word for word what they said? Then the unity of word, it's also difficult to define in a language that so far has never been written. Luckily, I had Craig's grammar for Nalik and a grammar for Kara. The languages are similar, so I already had an idea. And, uh, and then I translated and very likely, uh, luckily, and Mrs. Gurman speaks perfect English, also are other people, so I could get the meaning in English. And then I would ask, not always the meaning is one-to-one. -one. There were some words that she didn't know exactly how to translate. So then I would ask questions to understand exactly what's the meaning of this grammatical construction or words. For simple words, it's easy, like mango or uh, reef. Of course, when we move on to grammatical topics, like the difference between I have been singing and I have sung and I sang, but then it's more difficult and you need a lot of work to distinguish uh, among all these uh, all these meanings. It's not always easy. And of course I have not yet completely understood the whole of the grammar. But basically documentation is that to make a lasting record of a language, which is also multi-purpose. It can be used by linguists. It can be used by anthropologists. It can be used by the community to have a recording of their own language to use to teach children. We, and in La Curumau, I also produced, of, of, I, what I mean, what does it mean I? They produced, I just help in writing down. We produced uh, some school books for children in the preschool, so before prep, uh, so that they could read in La Curumau, just a sample of simple stories, words like the alphabet, animals, plants, colors, things like that. Um, so to sum it up, documenting, the, the process is to go there, record the language, transcribe, translate into piece in or English. I used English because it's easier or whatever other language you may want and create a lasting record digitally and um, also on, on paper. If there is the possibility, I did everything digitally because it will be stored forever and ever, hopefully. And, uh, and then, it, as I said, it must be multi-purpose in that, that I try to record different kinds of text genres, narratives, my life, my family, traditional narratives, but also conversations and procedurals, 
um, like instructions, for instance, how to bake uh, a sago cake. Uh, first, you take the leaves, then you do that and that. Why? First, because it, it gives us very interesting information about the culture of the community who speaks the language, but also for us linguists, because um, when we only analyze narrative language, this is something different than the language that then you use in conversations or you use in giving instructions. You have a lot of new words and new constructions that would never come up if you only record monologues or just people talking about their lives. So I try to vary as much as possible so that the people who will, I hope, but the community first, but also other linguists or everyone else who is interested, who will then have my collection in their hands, uh, will have a, as complete as possible glance onto the language and the culture that it represents. Thanks so much, Lydia. It sounds like a really valuable experience um, that you had in that community uh, and a, a, a really, really important thing that you've done for them documenting that language. We have just a little bit of time left before we move on to talking about uh, preservation of these languages and what can be done next. But first, I'd just like to hear from Craig about his experience in writing uh, or documenting the Nalik language um, and uh, exactly how the Nalik language interacts with the Lukuruma language as well. Um, yes, as Lydia says, Nalik and, and Lukuruma came from the same ancestor language. So they're very similar languages. And I'd been living in um, the Nalik area for quite a long time before uh, we had the idea that Lydia would come and work with the Lakurama language. I don't know if I've told Lydia this, but I was scolded by the elders in Lakurama village when I came and, and said, this is lady coming from Italy and she wants to um, document your language. And they said, you were supposed to be doing this a long time ago. Now you go away and you bring this lady in because she's more enthusiastic than you are. Um, but my my situation was, with Nalik was quite similar when I went to work there. I, uh, the difference being that I had lived in Papua New Guinea for a long time and was a, a senior high school teacher, so I had contacts in the community. So when I decided I wanted to do my PhD, I went to the community and I said, uh, I want to get a PhD. I am want to become a professor someday. I want to get a dissertation. This is what I want. Now, what do you people want? If I come to your village and, and work with your language. And they mentioned a number of things. They, they said they wanted to have a writing system for the language. They wanted to have a prayer book with Baha'i and Christian and Muslim prayers in it because the community has different religions. Um, they wanted to have help making school books for the um, primary school in their own language. And I said, okay, I can do this. And so then the community organized a language teacher for each day. I had a Monday teacher, a Tuesday teacher, a Wednesday teacher, and so on for the five days of the, of the working week. And I would spend a morning with each of those language teachers, learning how women speak, how young people speak, how old people speak. And in the same way that Lydia worked with uh, Lukuruma, I, I learned Nalik language and um, uh, documented it. And if I just like to point out what one of my teachers said, um, his name was Michael Ahomarang. Uh, he was a, a poet in the, the Noic, uh, Nalik language and uh, composed a, a lot of songs. And he said that the Nalik language is only spoken by 5,000 people. And in five or 600 years, quite possibly this language will no longer exist because Nalik people are marrying other people. He says, but when we produce something that's written in our language and they go to a museum and they see that book in their language, they'll know that people at this time were proud of their heritage and they wanted to pass on their heritage to people and their language to people, even if the language no longer exists, that people can pick up a book and learn the language of their ancestors and have access to the knowledge of their ancestors. And he says, because of that, uh, um, he said his descendants would be able to be proud of who they are. And so this is the work that we're doing now. We're working for, our, for the descendants of the speakers of these languages now, that, so that they can become proud of who they are and what their 
cultural and linguistic heritages. Um, when we developed the first book in the Nalik language and it was um, launched to the community, somebody picked up the book and gave a speech and he said, for years we've been following the white man like a dog yapping after the heels of somebody because he had the books and reused his books. But now we've got our own book. So we're equal to the Europeans. And I think this is also a very important thing that we, through documenting the language, through writing language down, through um, writing down uh, indigenous knowledge, we put them on the same level as languages of cultures who think they're very important and uh, allows this knowledge to be shared with people elsewhere in the world. Thanks, Craig. This is, I'm really glad that you brought this up. It's a nice segue into our, our final discussion about the, um, the extinction of languages in Papua New Guinea and uh, what can be done about it. Uh, Sakarapa, I'd like to start with you. Um, you've talked about before about the importance of language institutions. Uh, if you could just um, expand on that for us, please. And also um, just share with us uh, briefly about the different stages of extinction that, uh, that um, the communities are experiencing at the moment. Yes, I'm trying to find out ways to uh, save language. And uh, one of the ways that uh, I think is important is to establish some kind of structure, basically to look after our uh, many languages that we have. And that can probably be easily done by creating a language institute of some sort in Papua New Guinea. So that that institute can generate probably research on uh, vernacular top press languages on many of our languages. At the moment, uh, language research here is haphazard, not controlled. We don't know who is getting what kind of information and probably a structure like language, Papua New Guinea Language Institute might be the way to get people, task people to do particular research and we have information with us and kept in that kind of institute. And maybe also uh, students may be used in that to do their PhDs and masters by using the institute and they gather information for us. And it extends our educational opportunities to young people rather than just depending on universities to uh, train language, which we can't because of various restrictions, funding and other things. The number of quotas of students coming to do linguistics at the university is very, very small. So maybe finding another way, an institute, which might give us a better idea, a better chance. We might have better resource. Uh, the government might give us a bit more resource because we are an institute separate, so we can conduct more research, especially targeting folklore, language information, uh, language ecology, grammar of languages. So we can do a lot of this if we have an institute that controls this information. And most of the information we have may be kept in this institution for our younger generations and for other linguists other researchers and so on. So, so that's the kind of background I have in terms of talking about uh, promoting the idea of Institute, Language Institute in PNG. Thank you, Sakurabe. Craig, I might bring you in here. I'd like to ask you your thoughts on how the government uh, can contribute to preserving the languages. Is this just solely a responsibility of the Papua New Guinea uh, government or are there others that can help? Well, Australia has a very important responsibility due to Papua New Guinea because Papua New Guinea exists as a country because of Australian colonialism. Um, so in addition to what Sakarepe has said, um, and perhaps in support of what Sakarepe would like to be setting up um, with the Papua New Guinea Language Institute and to support the work at the University of Papua New Guinea where he is or the University of Guruoka, which also has a linguistic program. I'd like to see the Australian government uh, specifically give uh, scholarships to young Papua New Guineans to do their master's degrees and PhDs in Australia uh, 
in linguistics because Australia has very good linguistics programs. They're also very expensive linguistics programs. Uh, and in the overall scheme of Australian aid to Papua New Guinea, this would be a very small amount. And it would uh, help to develop a core of Papua New Guinean linguists like Sakarepe and like Kilala, uh, who are trained not only to educate people in Papua New Guinea, but also elsewhere in the world. Where Lydia works at the University of Cologne, there's a very good in, uh, department of Papuan languages. And if you go there, you will not see one Melanesian person at all. But if you go to a Chinese language department or a Japanese or German language department, you'll see Germans and Chinese um, and Japanese people. You'll see speakers of those languages. And so I'd like to see Papua New Guineans uh, working with linguistics, not only in Papua New Guinea, but also elsewhere in the world. We had a Brazilian researcher come to New Ireland, Claudio da Silva, and he was working with education. And he made the comment that Papua New Guineans are much more aware uh, with multiculturalism and multilingualism than most people in the world. And this is a gift that Papua New Guineans should be able to share with people elsewhere in the world, like Australia, which sometimes has ethnic tensions or misunderstandings because of language. And so I'd like to see Papua New Guineans involved much more academically outside of Papua New Guinea, as well as inside Papua New Guinea. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Clearly, education is coming up as a running theme tonight as well. Kalala, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit more about how uh, education um, can play a role in preserving languages in Papua New Guinea and just how uh, it can be better implemented. You, you talked before about how there are challenges with the implementation at the moment. What can be done to make it better and more successful? According to what I've seen so far, as I go around to schools, I mean, in, in the, the time when bilingual education was in existence, I was carrying out the research in various certain schools in the country. So what, like I said previously, like it was not being implemented correctly. And I think that's why you're asking me what could, can be done. So, uh, so one is if, if uh, that was, uh, if we want to make sure that children are continuing to learn and we preserve the languages to our these children, one of my recommendations is to reintroduce the bilingual education system in Papua New Guinea, that's just one alternative. But if it is to be reintroduced back into the PNC's education system, it needs to, the approach needs to be very uh, uh, done in a way that it is actually uh, useful. Uh, just like I said previously, that it wasn't taught correctly, you know, there were no uh, a teacher, it, it was not always the, the, the teacher who, who knows, who knew the language of the child. So if it was to be reintroduced, the education, uh, um, uh, what is it, the, 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 the authority who deal with teachers' postings must make sure that their teachers are posted to schools where they know the language. So therefore, when they teach their bridging, uh, bridging uh, ear, transitioning in that's year three, which is the bridging year from, um, from a vernacular or talk less to English, the teacher must be the speaker of the language who knows the language of the child. So that's one. The other, another, another problem that I found was to do with the, um, the, the, the teacher training itself. Teachers need to, to be trained uh, in the, um, I think that is, uh, that is another area that needs uh, to be looked at if, if we have, if we try to reintroduce this bilingual uh, education in the country, the, there has to be a component in the teaching tra teacher training curriculum so that teachers are well versed on how to, to teach bilingual education. And I think that was something that was missing in the teacher training uh, curriculum. So teachers, which is like on a ad hoc kind of uh, situation placed in there, but they didn't really know how to deal with uh, children on how to actually teach them the transition period. So that is one. Um, what else? Um, if it's not that, I was suggesting earlier on 
if it can be uh, it can be taught as a uh, as a subject, just like uh, uh, you know one of the other foreign languages. If if the education department does think that bilingual education is not uh, it won't work again, then why not uh, teach it as a subject so that at least uh, children who have now missed out or like who are now um, who cannot speak the language itself will still learn the language. So um, in fact, what I found in my bilingual education research was that um, the, um, the bridging situation was only done for uh, transitioning into English, but there was no allowance for language um, preservation or continuity into the future. It was mainly just to teach English. You see what I'm trying to say? So like there was a component in this uh, whole uh, bilingual transition program. What happened was like there was a certain percentage. Like uh, if for example, you start off, you, you come in at the transition period, maybe you start off with 90% or like maybe like 10% uh, or 20% English and 80% vernacular, and then as you go up the grade, the, 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 the percentage, uh, you know, like uh, reduces. Uh, so you, you go into the next grade and then maybe it's 60%, 40% vernacular until it's 100% English. I'm, I'm trying to explain something like that. So that is actually what the Department of Education was doing with regards to this bilingual education program in the country. But that was not, implemented correctly, simply because teachers need to undergo that specialized training in bilingual education to teach it well. So that is one. So I think I'm suggesting two things there. Either you bring back bilingual education or teach uh, the language as a subject. Thank you all so much for your frank and thoughtful answers today. I really found it so inspirational. I do hope that our listeners at home will be encouraged to continue on with their local languages in the home. And uh, perhaps for those that don't know another language, like myself, to uh, go out and start learning. Kalala, Sakarepe, Lydia, and Craig. Thanks again. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for your insights and to the audience at home for watching. This has been a special panel for the Lowy Institute's OzPNG Network. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Josh Goding, Andrea Pollard, and Shane McLeod for their assistance in producing this event. You can head to our website to view more of our events and podcasts. Thank you and goodbye.